The Ideas Exchange, in association with HSBC. Business minds are shaping the modern world. They've revolutionized our lives with technological innovation. They forge new relationships across continents. Their decisions affect what we do, how we work, where we live. In the Ideas Exchange, global business leaders travel the world to question one another. I'm very well. How are you? Nice good, good to see each of your company. They come head to head to share the hard lessons they've learned and their recipes for success. We don't stop playing when we grow old. We grow old because we stop playing. Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, the home and workplace of Bethlehem Tillehan Alamu. Bethlehem originally trained and worked as an accountant, but gave that up in her early 20s to found Soul Rebels. Now less than a decade later, it's an internationally recognized green footwear company. I came from a small village in, in Ethiopia, it's called Zenobok. In the village there is 5,000 people living, but um, People doesn't have any opportunity to work. Bethlehem set up Soul Rebels in 2005, and with the help of her family, has taken it from small beginnings to a global presence. Based in her home township of Zenobwerk, it has grown from five employees to involving over 300 in the local community, and now sells to 33 countries worldwide. People need opportunity. People need to be a part of something manufacturing, creating something, and then they're going to eat their own fruit. She was inspired by the crafts and the artisans of her native country and is determined that trade, not aid, is the future for Ethiopia. She's won many international awards for her enterprise and has already been named one of Africa's top five businesswomen. She is traveling three and a half thousand miles from Africa to Scandinavia to a town that is the birthplace and production center of a company with a three billion dollar turnover. She is looking forward to meeting the CEO and sharing experiences of leading a family owned company, exploring the problems involved and discussing the ways forward for brands as they expand globally. We both running a company, we both in international market. We both servicing different customers. Maybe we might service the same customers that we don't know. So these are some of the similar things. Bilund, Denmark, the home of Lego, maker of bricks and toys for over 80 years. It may look very different, but Bilund is a community of 6,000 souls, very similar in size to Seoul Rebels Township in Ethiopia. Jörn V. Knudstorp loves Lego. He played with it as a child. And when the call came in 2004, he gave up his chosen life of an academic and McKinsey consultant to help save his beloved brand, which was on the brink of bankruptcy. There were two priorities. One was to sort of stop the bleeding, if you like. That means stop the decline in sales. You always have to do that first, and any kind of cost cutting is not helping unless you really take the top line to stability, so that's really what we focused on for the first 18 months. Lego was established in 1932, and the company is still owned by the founding family, the Christiansons. It is the world's third largest toy manufacturer, behind Mattel and Hasbro, and it is estimated that there are 80 Lego bricks for every person on the planet. But what led the Christiansen family in 2004 to give up their reins of management to an outsider? Chemistry a values alignment, somebody to hand over their baby to, somebody who understood what they were trying to achieve. And then they saw a high degree of honesty about facing up to the facts, uh, somebody they could trust.
Bethlehem is meeting with Jörn at their Lego headquarters. He's keen to show her the history behind the brand and the production process at Lego. For me, this is sort of a treat. It's almost an indulgence to be able to exchange experiences and, and learn about doing business in a completely different place. First, they are going to sit and discuss their different approaches to business. And Bethlehem has her questions at the ready. When you come uh, to Lego to work, you came into the company that was not only on a break of failing, but it's a family company. Mm -hmm. uh, can you take me through the first experience that you had? Yeah. So uh, I think actually the first thing that struck me when I arrived at Lego was the particular sentiment in the house. This is a place where people are extremely enthusiastic to work despite the company not doing very well and this was very surprising to me but people were still enthusiastic about the brand and the product and the owning family and what I quickly learned was that this is a place where profit is a result of doing good things. Uh, this is a company where I would say the horse has been put in front of the cart so if we can make children happy if our customers are successful selling our products and employees are engaged and feel creative and motivated, then ultimately the company will make money. And it was very unusual for me to come into this kind of company and uh, with a family that was like this. The major challenge was that for many kids all over the world, Lego had become something of the past, a bit old fashioned. And uh, my challenge was to reconnect with the vitality and energy that is in something that's endlessly creative. And the key I found was uh, two words that I put together are called systematic creativity because building with Lego is really a very logical process. It teaches you how math and science is constructed. Some IT people, including the founder of uh, Google, said Lego is really a digital language because it's very logical. That was my aim to reposition the brand as something very modern. And in that process, of course, that also making Lego very cool in the opinion of the kids around the world. And I would say we really succeeded on that new identity or refreshed identity of the Lego brand. Lego grew from this house at the center of Bilund. The founder was a carpenter, and from his wooden toys, the modern Lego brick evolved. It was established in 1932 as an ethical family company. The word Lego comes from the Danish for to play well. And from the 1950s onwards, every brick was to be compatible with any other. It had become a part of many a child's growing up. But when Jörn took control, it seemed to have lost its way and was in danger of being taken over. And even as Jörn was dealing with Lego's problems, he still had the owning family looking over his shoulder. Working with the family uh, in a family-owned business is obviously absolutely critical relationship for a CEO, but even for the entire organization. And my view, to be honest, in the beginning was that the family was the part of the problem the company had faced. And I was very honest with them about it. And I think over the years I've really come to recognize the huge benefit of family ownership because it's a long-term stability. It's someone you'll never get rid of, so to speak. So they really signify authenticity and long-term values. And I think we found a, a good balance, and that is due to qualities on, on both sides. As Jörn steadied the Lego ship, he still had to make the company grow. How can a company predict what customers want? We're very engaged in design. We, we think a lot about design and design trends, including colors and feel and objects. So we have actually a group that we call the Future Lab, that really thinks about what happens the next five to 10 years, what are the trends. And they have uh, listening posts in places like uh, Beijing, Tokyo, Los Angeles, Munich. So within all of our major markets, we have people out there who are watching the trends. So when we launch, we launch big time. So it's a global campaign. It's a budget of at least 50 million US dollars just to launch the product. and. It all happens very quickly because in our business, 50% of sales happen within six weeks of the year uh, because the strength of the Christmas season. So accuracy in getting that right is essential for uh, commercial success. Wow, six weeks? Yes. Under Jörn's stewardship, some Lego production was contracted out. But the move didn't work as the new suppliers did not always manufacture to a consistent quality. So Lego brought production back in-house, where it remains. 
The Far East and China are an emerging market for Lego, but Yuan still hasn't taken production there. Why did you decide to do not go to China and to stay here? There, there were a number of different forces at play. I mean, one was um, that we are not going for the lowest cost manufacturing base just because we need quite a high level of qualification of labor to manage our manufacturing. And also we'd like to keep employees for many years, so we were not interested in this thing. For instance, China is called the migrant worker model where you get many thousands of employees and then come Chinese New Year, they leave or they go for another place, you pay minimum salaries. We wanted a stable workforce. We also need an environment where we can really control the quality and what we call the IP, our intellectual property, our secrets, if you like, but our know-how and technology. As we now look to manufacture in Asia, it's because demand is there. So if we manufacture in Asia, it's not to source from Asia to Europe and Americas, it's to supply the Asian region. And the time is now getting right for that as we continue to grow the business in Asia. Lego is once again highly successful, but Jörn acknowledges that the growth of his company has to be sustained even though he has many more competitors in the marketplace. What about the competition that you're getting with other uh, companies who are in the same industry like you? We are seeing a lot of competition. Uh, Lego has grown a lot in the past uh, seven to eight years, we've more than tripled the size of the company. So a lot of people are paying attention and saying there's something in here that's interesting. And I think uh, it's quite natural that uh, competition is coming in. I worry mostly about Lego uh, becoming complacent because of the success we're experiencing, because we've become a big company. I think there's not a single employee in Lego that doesn't know that that's a big worry for me because I talk to Lego about it all the time. People ask me, how do we avoid this complacency? And I say, go talk to the customer, because they always have something to complain about. One of my slogans is, listen to the complainer. Uh, because sometimes when you get a customer complaint, people will say, ah, but it's 1% of our customers, or 0.1% of our customers who speak up, and which is true. But I think for Lego to survive, we need to deliver extraordinary. So listen to the complainers, listen to the customer. That keeps you... Uh, on your foot all the time. And that's how I'd like to beat the competition, not by looking at the competition, but staying ahead of the competition exactly. all the time. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Bethlehem Tillerhan Alamu is one of Africa's leading businesswomen. Now in her mid-30s, she's the founder and CEO of Soul Rebels, an ethical shoe company based in Ethiopia that's gone global in less than a decade. Bethlehem has traveled to Denmark to meet the CEO of Lego, Jörn V. Knudstor. Jörn is the head of one of the world's most successful toy brands. We've heard his philosophy of business. Now he is very keen to find out more about Bethlehem's own business thoughts and about her unique brand. So Bethlehem, the, the first question I wanted to ask you, why the name Soul Rebels and, and where, where's the origins of the company? When we started the company, we see the opportunities around the village, and the opportunity was people were wearing the Barabasso or recycled tire shoe for a long time. So this shoe was worn by freedom fighters for Ethiopia for a long time. So that's why we call it Soul Rebels. The soul is us who are making this product, and then the soul, actual, the actual soul is coming from re recycled tires. But as well as being inspired by Ethiopian culture and history, there was a very personal reason that drove Bethlehem, the child of a hospital cook and an electrician, to create a global business. When I grow up, I see my father working hard and my mom also, but I don't forget one day when my mom sent a lunch for my father and I was taking the lunch to my dad. So. I saw him like he was fixing all the electrics in one, one building and I see him really sweating. So I got thinking like people are working really hard but there is no real change even if people are sweating every day. So that's, you know, inside me. I cannot forget that. And then today we're sweating like him but for a change. Each pair of Soul Rebel shoes is a labor of love reflected in an average retail cost of $50, very much a Western-style price tag. One of the things I've noticed uh, when you talk about the company is how you really hire people who have very much the passion 
for the product and the brand and the purpose and they're clearly there to do more than just make a living you're willing to pay people more than you have to but but how do you make sure also at the end of the day it is a business you're running it's not a charity and that people are close to the let's say the commercial reality of adding value and making sure there's a customer our product is uh, priced right we can compete with other brands out there so the profit margin is really good and people knows uh, the the brand really well so they're not going to hesitate to pay more money for handmade products. So the way we're producing the shoe is each and everything is done by hand. Everything cut by hand, put together by hand, sew by hand. It takes time to produce one pair of shoe in a day. When we're building that, we make sure that workers that we are hiring know why this brand is really important for us and for them too. Because it's not only my brand, if they're working in so Rebels, it's their brand also. We, if you want custom made, I mean, we can, we can, we can place. But not all cultures have the same tastes, and some have different shaped feet. So for Bethlehem, individual markets need unique approaches. We have to serve uh, different countries in different way. For example, if we take Japan, Japanese have got their own colors, their own tastes, their own design, their own things that they think it's going to suit them. So when it comes to Soul Rebels, we have to design uh, only for Japan to penetrate their market. If you go to States, it's another story. If you go to Taiwan, it's different. So based on people, and the countries, and then based on their culture, we have to find a way to, to sell our products. That's how we're doing it. It sounds to me like you're almost able to respond to almost daily reactions from customers, which I envy you because I think that shows a very flexible enterprise. Yes, because the size of my company is not like Lego. It's a yeah. small company that yeah. we're, we're running. But mm. if we develop the customer service that we're able to do now, it's not going to be a problem because we started from scratch. So yeah. it's based on people's feedback and interest. Yeah. Otherwise, we're not going to get that much market if mm. we say, this is what I'm going to produce. This is basically we're saying, this is what you are going to buy. Bethlehem has grown Soul Rebels from five employees to involving over 300 workers, all drawn from her local community. And all her materials are sourced within a 60 mile radius of her factory. How do you scale this? How do you make this the Nike of Africa or the, the global business without uh, losing this authenticity, I think, is, must be a key concern for you. Yeah, it's not going to be a threat because uh, we do have lots of hands, talented hands in Ethiopia who need opportunity to work. Yeah. And people are coming every day looking for job opportunities. Yeah. So we don't have lots of problems. What we do is, for example, when it's summer, we create a, a, a room for people to come in to, to train themselves how to make a proper shoe. When we have got big potential buyers, we bring them in and then they're going to do the work. So that means we do have people waiting for us to work. But our focus is to give opportunity for our society and then we need to keep so rebels for African brand. So that's going to be my focus. Bethlehem, like Yearn, listens to the complainers. If a customer has a complaint, they can contact Bethlehem by email and interact with her directly. And she has radical plans for the future of her company's internet sales. For many businesses, definitely for our business, the digitalization of the world is the biggest change that's happening in our lifetime. How are you thinking about that in your business, the impact of the digital technology and how it changes your opportunities and risks to run the business? Um, I see big opportunity. Uh, if we don't have the access of technology or internet, we're not going to make it. Mm. Uh, basically, we're, we're collecting our payments, orders, deliveries, everything by internet. So if we don't have that access in Ethiopia, we're not going to make it. I think that's going to be the future also. But now we stop selling through Amazon because we want to be behind our product 100%. Anybody who was uh, buying from Amazon, they can buy from Soul Rebels also. So that means we're 
interact with individual customers mm. and then the customers kind of come back and tell us the feedback how they feel when they pair they wear the pair of shoe and the feedback from around them that's a very bold move i really admire you've done that i mean amazon is the world's fastest growing retailer yes. with enormous reach in all regions of the world Seoul rebels hopes to double its turnover this year to two million dollars and within three years to be touching 15 million and yet for now, it is still entirely a family-owned and run company. That you are the owner of the company must be something very important. Do you want to remain the owner of the business to make sure it keeps its integrity and authenticity? Or would you like to bring in partners to fuel the future growth? The problem is once people get into your business, they want to control you. Of course. So we're not controlling <laughs> our destination. Yeah. So be, we build this, you know, we work hard to be here. So we're not able to just give it up. It's mm. like a child. My mm. business is like a child. Um, maybe it's going to grow. Maybe it's going to walk by itself mm. sometime. It seems to me that uh, when, when I heard first sort of the Nike of Africa, I thought this is about becoming bigger than Nike or beating Nike, but I think what you're doing is maybe something else. You're making a different kind of shoe company. We don't want to be exactly like Nike. Nike is a big company and everybody knows Nike. So if mm. Soul Rebels is aiming to be big like Nike, it makes mm. sense, but we're not Nike at all. By now, we want to be just like big like an Apple, mm. Apple company. Mm. So that's going to be our aim and we work hard to reach to reach that goal. How are you thinking about you spending your time to keep the identity intact? We work hard. <laughs> we don't have that much vacation. No. Uh, doing that, um, we constantly train ourselves and we are trying to predict what's going to come in the next few years. For example, the global environment, the economy is really vibrating every time. So how are we going to be sustainable in the business? Where are we going to be? Where Where is our brand going to be like stable or strong? Which mm. countries are good for us? So we it's always a challenge for us. One of the great advices that was once uh, given to me was that leadership is what happens when you are not there. So. Exactly. <laughs> Basically, I, I believe that I, I, I build a strong team there. Mm. So even if I'm not there, I'm not there now, I'm here. Mm -hmm. People are doing their job. Yeah. So those are the people uh, that I trust, that I believe that they can do things in my own way. So yeah. I really have that uh, strong team backing me up. I think many consumers who respect and buy into your brand also really identify with fair trade and the sense that this is a sustainable business based on local sourcing, etc. Uh, the way I see my company is like one big onion. Hmm. When you see the outside, you see a product. Yeah. That's it. You don't have to know who produced it. You don't have to know where it's come from. You just see a product, which is a footwear, it's a shoe. Hmm. So once you, you buy that shoe, you're going to see the brand. It's called Soul Rebels. You're going to read about it, like where is where does it come from? Who's making that? So you start like peeling the onions. So right there you get like, it's zero carbon methodology that we're using, it's fair trade, it's this, it's that. We don't sell those. We sell a product, which is, we really believe in it. Thank you very much for having this dialogue. No problem, thank you. After their conversation, Bethlehem and Jörn visited Lego's production facilities and took the time to reflect on their feelings about their encounter. It was much more than I expected, actually. The similarities were huge, and uh, I was kind of regretting that we were sitting here at the Lego base and not in Ethiopia, because I got really curious to see the setup. I learned a lot, uh, because we talked about sustainability, economy, and servicing different people. So he, he's thinking to come to Ethiopia to visit us. So it must be interesting for him too. Thanks Thank very much, much for coming. And really bye. appreciate it. Thank you very much. Bye. Safe travels. Thank you. Thank you. But there was one secret from his past that Jörn didn't tell Bethlehem. My first job was working as a kindergarten teacher for 18 months. 
And my father always says, that's where you learned all you know about leadership. <laughs> The Ideas Exchange, in association with HSBC.